Hello, everyone. Um, good morning, um, everyone. My name is uh, Gisela Gomes, and I am the COVID-19 Community Outreach Specialist at Thundermist. I am very excited to talk with our panel of experts about the COVID-19 vaccine and concerns surrounding pregnancy, lactation, and fertility. Thank you to everyone viewing to our presenters today. We have a lot of questions about the COVID-19 vaccine. And if you have questions, uh, put them in the comments below and we will do our best to try to answer them as, um, as they come through. Uh, we have Dr. Ina Rifkin and we have Dr. Perez Tala. They are with us today to answer your questions regarding the COVID-19 vaccine and pregnancy. Dr. Rifkin and Dr. Tyler, they are family medicine physicians at Thunder Mist Health Center who actually see patients of all ages with a special focus on uh, care and pregnancy. Dr. Rifkin, Dr. Tyler, thank you so much for doing this for us today. Welcome to our Facebook Live. It's a pleasure having you both here. And I would like to um, say good morning and a special thanks to Dr. Rifkin. How are you this morning? I'm well, thank you so much, Gisela. I'm Dr. Ina Rifkin. I'm really glad that we're having this conversation around pregnancy and the vaccine. Today, we'll get to separate some of the myths from the facts. Um, you know, it's been such a difficult year and there's finally signs of hopes. Um, there, this vaccine can end the pandemic um, and get us back to, to some sense of normalcy. Um, as of today, everyone ages 16 and older are eligible to receive the COVID-19 vaccine in Rhode Island. Um, Thundermist can vaccinate people 18 and older. Please visit our website for an appointment. Um, and I always assure that my patients that the vaccine is safe and effective. Great. Uh, again, thank you so much for being here. We we're going to have uh, a lot of questions for you. Um, and I will uh, go on with uh, introducing our next uh, doctor. And we have Dr. Tala. Dr. Tala, thank you so much for taking uh, time for being here with us today. Um, how are you this morning? I'm doing great, Gisela. Thank you all for coordinating um, this session for our patients. It's really very important. Um, and thank you, Dr. Rifkin, for joining us as well. I'm Dr. Tala. And yes, recent studies have confirmed the safety and efficacy of the COVID-19 vaccine in pregnant and lactating individuals. It's very exciting news for our pregnant patients. Um, there's also data on pregnant people who receive the vaccine and baby being born with antibodies, which are the proteins that help fight against the COVID virus. I hope this Q&A offers people who are hesitant with the right facts around the risk of getting the COVID-19 compared to being vaccinated while pregnant. Thank you again for being here. Um, I know this is has you know this we, we've been having a lot of questions uh, throughout the year you know throughout this last year it's so much happening um, so again every little information that we can get to our patients um, it's you know it's in, it's incredible it's incredible so thank you so much again for being here so thank you both and uh, okay this is why we're here today to give facts and help others. Um, make the best decision for them and their family. Uh, but before we uh, begin with the uh, Q&A, uh, Thunder Mist would like to recognize our Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island, uh, United Healthcare Community Plan of Rhode Island, uh, Tufts Health Plan and Landmark Medical Center for uh, generously sponsoring this uh, virtual series. So thank you for making this virtual series possible. Um, we are excited to have um, one of our baby shower sponsors with us today. Uh, Tufts Health Plan, uh, Wendy is here with us and she will explain how you can enter to win the grand prizes. So thank you, Wendy, for being here today, taking uh, your time 
to join us today. Uh, and so welcome. Thanks for being here. Do you want to talk a little bit about you and how we how they can enter for the prize? Yes. So thank you, Gisela. Um, so my name is Wendy Mann and I am the community relations rep for Tufts Health Plan for Medicaid in Rhode Island. Um, I appreciate you guys having me here today and I look forward to um, learning more about the topics of the vaccines and pregnancies. Um, so we're excited to announce there are raffle prizes for the virtual series and how you can enter to win. So there's a crib, there's a car seat stroller combo, baby monitor, and also an Amazon gift card. Um, how, how to enter. So while you're watching the session live or recorded, um, you can enter through the link or we can also put it on the comment section and you can enter through there. Um, so you guys have until Sunday the 16th to enter and the grand prizes will be um, sent by Monday, May 17th. So as a sponsor of Thunder Miss, right, I think the last four years, um, Tufts um, Health Plan offers a few resources for pregnant um, moms and their kids. So a few of the um, benefits that we do have is we offer a gift card for a booster seat or a car seat if you need it. We also offer gift cards if you take your kids to their well visits every year and they get their immunizations every year. So we offer a lot of different um, gift cards for different um appointments that you may take your kid to. If you have any questions, my email will be on the comment section. Um, and I hope you guys enjoy this event. Wendy, thank you so much. And thanks again, uh, Tufts Health Plan. Um, it's, it's as always, it's been a pleasure having you guys, you know, being part of, uh, you know, a lot of our events. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I love working with you guys. <laughs> Same, same. And I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, all of our patients appreciate you guys very, very much. Again, thank you so much for taking the time to uh, explain everything. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much for everything. You're welcome. I hope you all have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. Thank you so much. Okay, so let's get to work. We do have um, a lot of questions coming up, so let's get this started. Um, so um, again, I want to remind everyone who's watching us, if you have any questions, uh, please leave it down in the comment below, and uh, I'll make sure to get those questions answered at the end of the event, okay? All right, great. So uh, first question, it's going to be for Dr. Uh, Rifkin. So let's kick off the event with a big question. The question is, uh, doctor, is this vaccine safe for pregnant and for lactating moms? You, you sure know how to set up a set up a question, Giselle. <laughs> um, so the short answer is yes. Um, the long answer is, of course, there's lots of things that we are still learning every day about this. Um, the COVID vaccines, and there's three right now that are that are available in the U.S. Um, none of them were tested specifically during the trials in pregnant or lactating people. However, since the EUA has passed back in December, there's been over 90,000 pregnant women um, or lactating pregnant women, excuse me, that have received the vaccine. And safety monitoring is ongoing for all of these vaccines. We know how, you know, how closely they're watching these vaccines, because if you remember a few weeks ago, they actually paused the Janssen vaccine because of something that occurred one in less than a million cases. That is how closely they're observing the safety of these vaccines. Mm -hmm. And they are doing it through a number of different, um, different uh, uh, pathways. Um, there are vSAFE data that folks who have received the vaccines are self-reporting. There's the VAERS data. There's also reporting happening through um, the CDC and through the individual vaccine makers. And again, there's so much scrutiny over these vaccines because everybody wants to make sure that, that they are safe. But also after the year and a half almost now that we've had, we really want to have an effective way out of this. Um, so 
I mentioned that there's been over 90,000 uh, people who are pregnant who have received this vaccine. In all of those cases, um, there's not been any safety signals that have come up, meaning nothing, even that's one in a million, um, that has flagged as as being a safety issue. Um, so I hope that helps. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is for Dr. Tala. Uh, Dr. Tala, are vaccines safe, you know, throughout all the stages of pregnancy? Yes, definitely they are safe throughout um, all, sta all stages of pregnancy. So that's first trimester, second trimester, and third trimester, and even after delivery, of course. Um, you know, there's been a question raised about um, the side effects, which we'll talk about later on, but one of them being fever. Um, if there is any association between the fever that you have from the side effects of the vaccine and possible um, birth defects in the first trimester specifically. And a study actually was done recently in Denmark looking at that specific question, and there was no evidence that fever in the first trimester led to any birth defects. As a matter of fact, we are seeing that the earlier you receive your vaccination, um, the higher the amount of antibodies that um, are transmitted to your newborn. Mm -hmm. So promoting, you know, receive your vaccination as soon as you can. And I know in some states, it's not necessarily available to everyone, but you know, for those who have access to it, just to get to it sooner than later. Gisela, you're okay. muted. Sorry. <laughs> uh, can, um, Dr. Tala, can you please um, talk a bit about the side effects people can expect um, you know, during the COVID vaccine available? And what is it like a normal reaction? Yes, definitely. Um, so if you're getting the COVID vaccine, which is what majority of my patients are scared about, is that side effect. They're like, well, Dr. Tala, I don't want to have, you know, all these things that my relatives are having. And then I ask them, but would you rather have the things that, you know, COVID-19 causes during pregnancy, which again, we'll talk about later. But um, some things to expect are like a flu-like symptom, if you've ever had the flu before. Um, and it's especially predominant with the second dose, not to say that you cannot get it with the first dose. As a matter of fact, I got, um, I was, I felt worse with my first dose than I did with my second dose. Um, so expect to feel like um, and, and these effects are very common with other vaccines as well. So it's not necessarily particular to COVID-19 vaccine. So things like um, uh, like uh, soreness or pain or redness around the injection site. So that's very common. Um, some people have told me it felt like the tetanus shot if you've ever had that. It, it feels like someone punched you in that arm. Um, and just my myalgias, which are like body aches. So just aching in your joints, um, your back, um, what have you. Um, you could have fever um, upwards of like 102, 103 degree Fahrenheit. So that's not unusual. Um, having chills, um, just feeling really fatigued and having a headache. Those are the common ones um, that could happen. And of course, you could throw up, um, have different types of reactions, which usually occur within 24 hours of you getting it. Um, might linger a day longer, but usually within 24 hours is when people bounce back and start to feel like themselves. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Rifkin, since the vaccine is not yet available for children um, up to the age 16, if I get the vaccine, would that help to keep my family safe from the virus? Great question. And it's also very timely. We're actually awaiting the um, meeting of the ACIP, which is kind of the um, vaccine decision task force of the of the CDC this week, with the hope um, that the data is convincing enough to get authorization for kids 12 to 15. So we're really um, keeping our fingers crossed for that. Um, but yes, you getting the vaccine helps protect those around you. And the way that that happens is you are much, much, much less likely to have COVID if you have the vaccine. Nothing is ever 100% effective. Nothing in life is ever 100% really. Um, and so the rate of 
pe vaccinated people getting COVID is exceptionally low. Um, but even those who do get COVID, they seem to have a much lower um, viral load. And that means that they are much less likely to get severely ill. Um, and they're much less likely to transmit it. Um, so, hey, if you're at very, very low risk to get COVID, you can't pass it on to your unvaccinated teenager. Um, and even if you, if your teenager happens to get COVID at school or, uh, you know, on the playground or out with their friends or whatever, you're then much less likely to also get it. Or even if you do get it much, much more likely to have a very mild course. Great. Thank you for that. Um, Dr. Tala, um, what are the risks of infection if you get COVID-19 during pregnancy? And do they outweigh any uh, risk in getting the vaccine? That's a great question. I think um, majority of my office visits are really focused on this question and this conversation, which is a very important question to ask. Um, so there are quite a lot of risk of getting COVID-19 during pregnancy. So we have to go back to like the pathophysiology of pregnancy, which I'm not going to bore everyone with. But the, the summary is um, due to the changes and um, with your blood flow and your immune system, when you're pregnant, your immune system is not as robust as the counterpart, your counterpart. So someone who is not pregnant. So it goes without saying that you are at an increased risk for infection, right, compared to someone else who is not pregnant. So therefore, you know, if that risk increases and you end up, you're, you're, if, if you're at increased risk of getting infected, you are also at increased risk of hospitalization. So spending a couple of days in the hospital, secondary to um, symptoms that you're getting, be it shortness of breath, chest pain, what have you. And the research is also showing that unfortunately, pregnant patients with COVID who are hospitalized are also at an increased risk for ICU admission, which means intensive um, care unit. Um, and in that setting are also at increased risk for intubation, which means a breathing tube down your throat to help breathe for you. So you can imagine that you are already pregnant, which alone, it's a stressor in itself for your body and you are adding on that additional stressor of an infection, um, which could lead to preterm labor. So that means, you know, having contractions, having cervical changes, and eventually potentially delivering an infant, right? Who is has no business being out in the world at that time, you know, depending on when you get infected. Um, so I'm assuming like greater than 37 weeks. Um, and we know that um, when, babies are born prematurely, these babies struggle and suffer and have um, a lower likelihood of survival compared to babies who are born later on, are more termed, their lungs are developed and what have you. So we're looking at increased risk for death in the infants, in that baby who was born early, and death in mom as well, um, just because of all these additional stressors that are happening. Um, so definitely in my mind, all of these risks <laughs> outweigh um, the side effects that we get from the vaccine. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for, for that. Um, Dr. Rifkin, um, this is a question that comes up a lot, you know, especially, you know, with moms trying um, to get pregnant. So um, would the vaccine affect fertility? So this is an easy one. The answer is no. Um, the this came out. This myth came out somewhere, um, and it's hard to really track down where it came from. But there is no scientific evidence that the vaccine has any impact on fertility. Um, you know, I think we've all seen the social media memes and and posts and things like that that talk about the spike protein being similar to a protein on the placenta, but that physiologically doesn't even make sense. Um, you know, fertility implies getting pregnant. Uh, in order to develop a placenta, you have to already be pregnant. Um, but also, there's lots of women who have had COVID and have gone on to have pregnancies. So if this was, if there was some basis to this myth, then those women who had COVID would not be able to, would have fertility issues. And we haven't seen that. So there's really no, there's no um, scientific basis to this myth. Um, there is no risk 
to your fertility that is thus far known from the vaccine. And seemingly uh, from COVID, at least to women who have a, excuse me, to people who have a uterus, um, there was some thought, and again, not fully proven that there may be some effect on sperm motility and things like that impacting fertility from the, um, from the sperm side. But we haven't seen anything in COVID or in uh, the vaccine that impacts fertility for those uh, with a uterus. That is absolutely something great to know. You know, we do have so many women out there who are, are going through fertility treatment. They, you know, they, they worry about, you know, things like that. So thank you so much for that information. Um, Dr. Tala, um, our next question is for you. Would you recommend the COVID-19 vaccine to someone who already had the COVID-19? Um, definitely, yes, I would recommend that. Um, I, I think another important question that comes up is the timing of when these people should be able to receive the vaccination. And the evidence shows that as soon as you know you are out of the, your symptomatic isolation time frame, it's safe to go ahead and be vaccinated. Um, if you get the the first dose and say you you do get infected by the COVID or you test positive or what have you, um, it's okay to go ahead and get the second dose. There's no need to delay um, the administration of dose, dosage. And it's it's reasonable too, if you want to stay for 90 days. So, uh, you know, you've probably heard in the news or three months um, from being infected to receiving your first dose. It's, it's reasonable if you want to do that because um, the research does show that you have a lower risk of in reinfection during that time frame. So that's reasonable as well. But yes, um, everyone who has gotten infected by COVID-19 should get the COVID-19 vaccine. And um, since we are on this topic, let me ask a question that it's not on the script, but it's a question that a lot of people, you know, is still a little iffy about. Um, and one of you can answer this. If you had COVID, can you still get COVID for the second time? And Dr. Rifkin, you can go ahead and answer that if you like. Because I mean, it's a lot of people say, oh, I have COVID, I already had COVID. I, I, I don't, I, I'm not gonna get COVID again. What do you think about this question? Yeah, the unfortunate answer is that yes, you can. Um, <laughs> the, the, and there's a number of reasons for this. Um, one reason is, of course, we've all been hearing about the variants, right? The variants rising up and the mutations that are happening within the virus. Um, and so you can get a different, you can get ill with a different variant of COVID. The other part of this is that the immune system is really complex. A natural infection stimulates one aspect of the immune system um, that creates a certain type of antibodies. But vaccination, um, it uh, stimulates a different part, uh, an additional part of the immune system um, where it triggers what are called memory T cells. Um, and so that's not stimulated by natural infection. Um, and the vaccine provides a longer immunity. Um, now, you know, kind of going off a little bit on a tangent here, people will say, well, you know, we don't know how long the immunity will last from the vaccine and people are already talking about boosters. That's true. We don't know. Uh, but so far, things are looking really good. And the folks that were vaccinated during the trials, which has now been um, I want to say close to eight months. Um, and then those of us in healthcare who were lucky to have access to vaccinations early on, we're not seeing people lose their antibodies and we're not seeing people get infected at a higher rate if they're more than six months out of a vaccine. So yes, theoretically, there's a, it is possible that we will need boosters at some point, whether our immunity will wane or whether, um, you know, new variants will arise that seem to escape the uh, protection afforded by the current vaccines. But luckily, we're not there yet. And luckily, uh, you know, the variants that have arisen so far, we still seem to have protection from the vaccines. And with all of the fears that um, protection would wane by about six months, we're not seeing that yet. So, so there's really a lot of reason to be hopeful that these vaccines will provide long-lasting immunity. 
how long, I, you know, we don't, and that's the truth. Thank you so much know, for I don't know if anything to add. <laughs> well, thank you so much for answering that. It's a question that you know a lot of people have regarding, you know, if they already had COVID, if they can still get it. So that's thank you for that. Really appreciate it. Um, um Dr. Rifkin, so after someone is fully vaccinated, should they still follow the precautions to prevent the COVID-19 or they are off the hook? So the CDC has been um, updating their their recommendations on what you know what kind of precautions we all need to take. Some of it depends on your level of risk. Some of it depends on the rates of infection within your um, area, um, and and some of it you know depends on on your individual risk of infection. So if you're somebody who is at high risk for complications from COVID nineteen whether that be because you're pregnant, whether that be because you're immunocompromised for other reasons, um, you know, you, you have underlying lung issues, what have you. For those people, even though you're vaccinated and you, uh, you have a good level of protection, you should still continue to mask and distance. Um, for folks who live in an area with very high rates of infection, you should still continue to take precautions because again, nothing is 100% and this vaccine is certainly not 100%, but it's pretty, pretty great. Um, you know, as compared to to vaccines in general um, and other treatments. Um, if you are lucky enough to live in a place such as the Northeast, we're in Massachusetts, Rhode Island, New Hampshire, we are actually seeing pretty low rates right now, um, and, our, and our rates of vaccination are pretty high, um, and you are spending some time with other vaccinated folks, um, or even if you are vaccinated and you're spending time with one family who is not vaccinated, your risk of infection is very low and you can take off your mask. Um, if you're spending time outdoors and you're able to maintain distance, it's okay to take off masks. Um, now, you have to follow guidelines based on local observances, you know, private enterprises and zoos and parks and things like that. They have the right to set uh, preferences for their location. And so I went tulip picking for, for Mother's Day yesterday and the tulip farm required everybody to be in a mask and we should respect that and we should be masked if the business asks us to be masked. But your risk of acquiring COVID is of course much lower. Um, if you know that you're attending an event where everybody's vaccinated, probably you don't need a mask. Is it okay to still mask because you're cautious and you don't know how many of those folks are vaccinated? Absolutely. Thank you. I know that all of us are just dying to get rid of these masks. We um, we miss the smiles. We miss looking at people's you know reaction, like face reactions and everything. And again, we we're getting there. We're getting there slowly but surely. We're getting there. Uh, again, you know, this whole process, we just have to be very patient and we are going on the right direction. Um, thank you for that answer. So um, our last question is going to go for Dr. Tower and Dr. Refkin. Um, can you talk about your experience getting the vaccine and why you chose to get vaccinated? So let's um, start with Dr. Tower first. Definitely. For me, it was a non-brainer, like a no-brainer for me. Um, I am a risk evader, <laughs> um, first thing. So the second thing is um, working in the hospital and seeing patients um, suffering um, secondary to the um, adverse effects of COVID-19 and dying um, was, was, was surreal. It was very tangible for me. Um, and as a physician, we swore an oath to do no harm. Um, the way I see the COVID, receiving the COVID-19 is doing no harm to the people around me because I know that once I'm vaccinated, I have a lower risk of being infected and a lower risk of transmitting. So the, it, it, I, I read up on the vaccine, did my research, and I said, I'm game, let's do this. So it was, it was a no-brainer. It didn't take a lot of convincing. <laughs> Thank you. How about you, Dr. Refkin? How did you feel about getting vaccinated? 
I was excited to get vaccinated. I have to say that I am not somebody who's an early adopter of things most of the time. And, you know, when people were asking me um, last summer when the vaccine was in development, oh, are you going to get the vaccine? I was saying, you know what, I have to wait and see. I have to wait and see the data. I really I'm not going to jump on it if I if I don't like the data. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, I think with this whole process, there's been a lot of misinformation for, for a variety of reasons. Um, and this whole health issue has become very politicized. And this is not this isn't politics. This is health. This is uh, this is science. And so I, I I don't listen to I don't I don't listen to the news. Um, I don't you know, I don't have uh, uh, news channels that I subscribe to. I really was following the data from scientists. Um, you know, I follow certain experts in the field of epidemiology and virology, and I was looking at their at the data and at their interpretation and summary of the data, and that was what convinced me to get the vaccine. And so, yes, when the vaccine was made available to healthcare workers, I got my shot in the first week that it was available because I really I I, I want to protect my family. I want to protect my patients. Um, I want to protect all those vulnerable individuals who at that time were not able to, to have the vaccine. Right. Um, and, you know, Gisela, you mentioned how much we all miss the smiles and the face expressions and being with our friends and family. And this is one step towards getting there. And I, like everybody else, I think desperately miss those connections. Um, you know, before COVID, I'm one of those doctors who will hold your hand and who will give you a hug and a visit. And I've missed that with my patients. I don't know <laughs> when, if ever, we're going to get back to that. Um, but, you know, as family doctors, and especially for Dr. Tal and I, doctors who um, get the opportunity to be involved during such a critical period of people's lives when they're growing their families, um, it's, a really, it's a really deep connection. And in order for us to, to be able to protect our patients and to be closer in a safer way, um, I agree with Dr. Tala, it was a no-brainer by the time the data came out. Not not last summer when the data wasn't out, but when the data came out and I was able to, to look through that um, through the lens of science, it, it became a no-brainer. And you know, I've uh, encouraged my entire family to get vaccinated as soon as it was available to them. Um, I can't wait, uh, hoping for the data to come out this week on the 12 to 15 year olds, um, and then eagerly awaiting the data for younger children that may be available as early as the fall. So keep hoping. Yeah, so we are, we are all waiting for that. I do have to say that to me it was no brainer either. As soon as that vaccine came out, I was one of the first ones. I was one of the fortunate ones to um, be vaccinated. And again, didn't think twice. Um, you know, working in the healthcare field, I think we have to trust you know, the, um, you know, the healthcare and trust, um, you know, the scientists and everyone that worked for this vaccine. Uh, again, when this vaccine, uh, I'm sorry, when the pandemic first came out, we were all hoping and praying for when is this vaccine going to come out? You know, when is this ever going to come out so we can get back to normal? You know, and now it's here. And um, I think we should all take advantage of, you know, this opportunity. Before we started the live, uh, we were talking about how we there's so many other countries out there. They're so behind us, you know, so behind on the vaccination. We are very, very fortunate to be vaccinated to basically almost everyone being able to be vaccinated already. And, you know, and we still have so many other people dying in other countries and other states um, who are so behind on the vaccine, you know. So, again, it's, um, you know, just reminding everyone that this is safe. Um, it's effective. And again, uh, we are monit monitoring this uh, vaccine very closely. And, you know, we want to tell everyone to, you know, get vaccinated. Let's end this pandemic as soon as possible. You know, the more we vaccine, you know, vaccinate, the more, the, the faster we can end all this, you know. Um, so, again, thank you again uh, for your time um, today. I know you guys have like really busy schedules and I really appreciate 
you know, every, you know, for everyone being here. Um, I hope you enjoy getting to know uh, our providers and our sponsors. And um, again, this um, this live is recorded. So if you have any question uh, that you uh, didn't get to ask, uh, you can put down in the comment below and we'll find a way to answer your questions. And um, again, before you leave uh, today's session, be sure to answer to win the grand prize uh, raffle. Uh, participants can look in the comments for a link to enter, uh, to win or uh, visit the uh, link below. Um, again, today's session is recorded. We can go back and, you know, listen to our experts talking about the vaccine. And again, thank you, Neighborhood Health Plan of Rhode Island, uh, United Healthcare Community Plan of Rhode Island, and again, Tufts um, Plan and Land Landmark Medical Center for generosity sponsoring the, the virtual uh, area. And again, if you need prenatal care, on their mess offers services for all ages and does not turn away anyone due to the ability to pay. So again, if you need an appointment, please give us a call at 401-767-4100 to schedule an appointment today. Again, in if you also need to be vaccinated, please call the number 767-4100. You need to be a patient of Thunder Miss Health Center in order to receive uh, the vaccine? You do not, I'm sorry to interrupt. You you no longer need to be a patient of Thunder Mist Health Center to receive a vaccine with Thunder Mist. Wow, I guess that, that's sorry. awesome. Sorry, changes every day. <laughs> All right, awesome. So when did that came out, doctor? Um, I think last week or the week before we were able to open it up to the general community. Um, so if anybody needs a vaccine or knows somebody who needs a vaccine, um, you can call the number, you can go on our website to register uh, for a vaccine. Um, and I, I also just want to say a big thank you to you, Gisela, for moderating and for Thunder Mist for making this available. I feel like I have this conversation with patients um, on a daily basis, um, and it's nice to be able to, to have it to a broader community. I would also say that if you have any additional questions, reach out to us, um, ask your doctor, provider, whoever. Um, there's also um, a link posted in the chat to a nice little decision tool that was put together by um, some doctors over at uh, University of Massachusetts Bay State um, that kind of walks you through um, reasons and decision points of whether or not to get a COVID vaccine if you're pregnant or lactating. So perhaps somebody will find that helpful as well. All right, so you do not have to be a patient of Thunder Miss Health Center in order to make an appointment. And yay, that's, we've been waiting for this news too. I probably miss this somewhere, but I thanks for letting me know. Um, again, call the number 401-767-4100 to get your vaccine. And Dr. Rifkin and Dr. Tala, are you both uh, accepting new patients? Yes. I yeah. definitely am. Dr. Rifkin is too. She's nodding her head. <laughs> yeah, so we're, we're at different locations. Dr. Tal is in Winsacket. I'm at Warwick. Um, both sites are accepting patients and we're accepting uh, uh, folks for pregnancy care uh, um, and, you know, all ages uh, outside of pregnancy care as well. Awesome. Thank um, you so much again for taking your time for being here. Um, I hope you have a great rest, uh, a great week. And again, um, we we'll hope to see you guys again in the future. Thank you so much for everything. Bye everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.